All right, good morning, excellencies, colleagues, or good afternoon for those of you joining online. My name is Jenna Russo, and I'm the Director of Research here at IPI and the head of IPI's Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for this public policy forum on the upcoming 2023 Peacekeeping Ministerial taking place from 5th to 6th of December in Accra, Ghana. The purpose of our time here today is to reflect on the upcoming ministerial and to provide an overview of the preparatory conferences that have been held in advance of the ministerial. This year, in line with the identified priorities for the ministerial, preparatory conferences were held on the topics of women and peacekeeping, mental health support for uniformed peacekeepers, safety and security, and the protection of civilians and strategic communications. In a few moments, we'll have an opportunity to hear more about each of these topics. But first, please allow me to express my appreciation to Ambassador Agiman and the Mission of Ghana for collaborating and co-hosting this timely event with us at IPI. And I would also like to recognize a strong partnership that IPI has with the UN Department of Peace Operations. And it's our pleasure to welcome here today the Under Secretary General. I'd also like to thank the Kingdom of the Netherlands for their generosity in supporting IPI's work on the ministerial. This year's UN Peacekeeping Ministerial will be held in the context of an increasingly complex and evolving geopolitical landscape, which directly impacts the performance and effectiveness of peacekeeping operations. Most missions are operating in the context of conflicts that are protracted and that lack viable political processes, while facing added challenges of climate change, pandemics, trans transnational organized crime, and the misuse of emerging technologies. Even as we work towards innovating new models to respond to today's peace and security crises, we continue to hone the institution of UN peacekeeping, which remains a central and critical tool to collective security. For this, the commitments and priorities enshrined in A4P and A4P Plus remain relevant, and we urge member states to remain focused on their effective implementation. It's also important to remind ourselves of the direction provided by the high-level independent panel on peace operations, anchored in the primacy of politics, the indispensability of partnerships, and the centrality of people. Just last week, IPI, in partnership with the Austrian Mission to the UN and DPO, convened a workshop that brought together member states to reflect on how peace operations can be transformed and strengthened through multilateral partnerships. And this is based on the recognition that effective response requires all of our collective efforts working together for the sake of peace. And for this, we would like to recognize Ghana for hosting the upcoming UN Peacekeeping Ministerial which provides an opportunity for member states to strengthen their commitments to peacekeeping through requisite training, equipment, and personnel. And it's been our great pleasure to partner with Ghana in support of their work as host, and we look forward to a very productive ministerial in a few weeks. Before we turn to our panelists, it's my pleasure to welcome today Under Secretary General for UN Peacekeeping, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, to give opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. And let me begin by thanking the International Peace Institute for the invitation to come and speak about the upcoming peacekeeping ministerial meeting. The 2023 UN peacekeeping ministerial meeting will be a very important event for member states to express their enduring political support to UN peacekeeping and for ministers to demonstrate their commitment by making pledges that will strengthen the effectiveness of our operations. This kind of explicit support is critical during the during this challenging moment for UN peacekeeping. I would like to thank Ghana as host of the uh, ministerial meeting and, and, and its uh, permanent representative, uh, my dear friend, uh, His Excellency Harold Agiman, whose team has been working tirelessly. I mean, you have been working also tirelessly. Everybody's been working tirelessly to plan this ministerial meeting while at the same time serving as an elected member of the Security Council and the sixth largest provider of UN peacekeepers. As such, we recognize that Ghana is making tremendous contribution to peacekeeping. This ministerial meeting in Accra is right around the corner. We already have a large number of member states registered, most at ministerial level. The deadline is the 20th of November, so more, more registrations are expected. 
Member states are in the process of firming up the pledges to be announced in uh, Accra. The initial list of capability pledges, what we call our UNDPO shopping list, as well as training and other support that we have received is encouraging. I would like to reiterate the importance of conveying your intended pledges to Ghana and us in advance of the ministerial meeting in line with the UN pledging guide. Capabilities that are particularly needed include aviation units, unmanned aerial systems or peacekeeping intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance units, as well as investment in technology to counter drones for base protection. I also want to highlight the importance of pledges of staff officers with specialized expertise, for example, public information officers, officers with expertise in information acquisition, data analysis, as well as counter ID trained staff officers. We also need pledges of verified units for the rapid deployment level of the so-called PCRS, Peacekeeping Capability Readiness System. The groundwork for the pledges and the substantive discussions was laid in the four preparatory meetings, each focused on themes that Ghana selected for the ministerial meeting. You will hear more about those discussions from the co-chair representatives, who I would like to thank for their support throughout the ministerial process. There are a few themes that I would like to touch on briefly. First, I look forward to participating in a dedicated side event at the ministerial meeting to discuss ways of enhancing women's participation in UN peacekeeping and the role of gender responsive leaders. As you know, we keep saying that more women in peacekeeping means a more effective peacekeeping. This topic was explored at the prep meeting in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and rightly will be given its own spotlight in Accra. Environmental management is another cross-cutting area in which we expect pledges. Member states can pledge to deploy with renewable energy or, or portable solid waste equipment, or provide these capability to, to other troop and police contributing countries, while supporting secretariat efforts at reducing emissions environmental footprint. A dedicated side event at the ministerial meeting will discuss this issue in more detail. Conduct and discipline has recurred as a theme throughout the preparatory meetings, and we hope to benefit from sharing the best practices of member states and identifying opportunities for growth, particularly in the area of partnerships. So the ministerial meeting will provide a unique forum for high-level discussion about strengthening peacekeeping. We're very grateful to Ghana for the pertinent themes that have been selected and will be discussed in the three sessions at this meeting. The first session will discuss capabilities for mandate delivery and ensuring effective operations, including protection, safety, and security and technology. Session two will delve into capacity building and training, including for mental health. The final session will explore the conditions for peacekeeping success, including host government support, conduct, and strategic communication. The success of the ministerial meeting will depend on high level participation from a majority of our peacekeeping stakeholders and a strong expression of political support, as well as concrete pledges. So I encourage all of you to advocate for this with us. Now, as you indicated, Jenna, I mean, this is all happening against the backdrop of uh, uh, tremendous uh, challenges to uh, the world, to the world security, to the UN, and to peacekeeping as an important part of the UN's activity in the area of peace and security. We need to think of how to improve the tool that we currently have, which are the current peacekeeping operation, and that will be the purpose of the ACRA meeting. It's a very important purpose, uh, discussing all the pledges, discussing about the various themes that I alluded to. But we also need to think further, medium term and long term, what is the future of peace operation how can multilateralism remain a credible uh, response, uh, including through field operation to challenges to peace and security? And what can we do in order to make sure that this will uh, be the case? Um, the new agenda for peace provides a number of uh, avenues and uh, uh, proposal uh, for this to happen. And uh, as member states will begin to process the uh, new, agenda for, new agenda for peace, including uh, what it says about peace operation, we're planning to continue our outreach to member states to elaborate on the new agenda for peace, uh, hear their comment and reaction, and make sure that uh, uh, we, all of us will be prepared, not only for the summit of the future, uh, but more importantly, for the next phase uh, of 
peace operations, make sure that uh, we have explored all the avenues to make sure that we uh, will uh, remain, I say multilateralism will remain in, um, uh, in opposition to provide field-based response to the number to the to the very many uh, crises that are currently affecting the world security. So I will stop here. Thank you for your attention, and of course we look forward to the uh, ministerial meeting. Thank you so much, Under Secretary General, for those remarks, and in particular for reminding us of the importance of thinking ahead to the future of peacekeeping, even as we look to support the immediate mandate implementation for those currently on the ground. Thank you for that. Before we turn to our panel to cover the specific topics of the preparatory conferences, it's my pleasure to welcome here today Ambassador Agiman, permanent representative of Ghana to the UN, to provide us with an overview of the upcoming ministerial and the identified priority topics that we'll be discussing today. Ambassador, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna, and good morning, colleagues, excellencies. Um, let me begin by thanking the International uh, Peace Institute for being a partner of Ghana in our preparation for the 2023 Peacekeeping Ministerial Meeting in Accra, through, among others, the preparation of useful background papers on the teams. We are pleased to be able to join with you and all the others this morning uh, to enable us to provide an overview of the preparatory conferences that have been held in advance of the ministerial. I also like to uh, thank uh, USG Jean-Pierre Lacroix and his team who have been uh, our strong partners in the process in preparing for the Accra ministerial and have worked with us every step of the way in the journey to Accra. As is well known and as has been indicated by Jean-Pierre, uh, peacekeeping is at a critical crossroads and we see operating environments becoming more complex and challenging. Uh, some host states being less cooperative uh, with the United Nations peacekeeping presence in their countries. And also we see gaps in the expectations that exist between host communities, as well as the mandates that we provide and what is actually achievable on the grounds, as has been indicated by you also, Jenna. And all these require that we must, among others, enhance the capabilities of peacekeeping and the performance we want to see delivered on the ground. And I have no doubt that peacekeeping itself, which was born out of necessity and innovation, has the capacity to evolve and adapt to the changing circumstances that we are facing. And you rightly also mentioned the HIPO report of the Secretary General, uh, the emphasis on the need for primacy of politics, uh, the strengthening of partnerships, as, as well as the focus on people, which uh, in a sense, represents the, the issues that even any evolved form of peacekeeping or, or any form of uh, peace operations that we are envisaging should also need uh, to take into account. In terms of the objectives for the Accra Peacekeeping Ministerial, um, this is the first ministerial to take place on the continent of Africa, and we are very deeply appreciative to have had that opportunity to host it. And um, the aims are to achieve concrete outcomes that will, would improve peacekeeping operations in line with the ongoing reform efforts. Essentially, the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping, the A4P Plus, as well as the Digital Transformation Strategy that has been elaborated. Um, in terms of specific objectives, there are uh, two major ones. One is to ensure, as has been indicated by Jean-Pierre, um, the generation of high performing and specialized capabilities and other pledges that meet the UN needs. And two, new or expanded sustainable capacity building, training, and equipping, equipping partnerships in key areas. Uh, for the team of the ministerial and looking at some of the challenges that we see on the ground, we carefully selected five themes, which have also formed the basis for the preparatory uh, conferences that have been held. Uh, these teams are related to the protection of civilians, the strategic communications, um, including how we better, we are able to better respond to misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech, the safety and security of uh, peacekeepers. As we see, the operating environment is more complex. Uh, threats have evolved in terms of IEDs and other um, uh, nefarious uh, groups like terrorists who attack peacekeepers. 
the mental health of peacekeepers, uh, which is important um, part of the strengthening of peacekeeping, because essentially boots on the ground means that uh, you need to make sure that the people who are in the theater are able to have the mental well-being required to be able to execute this difficult and challenging task. And of course, women in peacekeeping, which everybody now acknowledges as an important element to enhance the outcomes of peacekeeping operations. Um, for the peacekeeping um, preparatory conferences, we've had in Bangladesh excellent discussions from the 25th to the 26th of June on the theme of women in peacekeeping. And this was co-hosted by Bangladesh, Canada, and Uruguay in a virtual format, Ghana together with the Republic of Korea and the United Nations also held on the 18th of July constructive discussions on the topic of mental health of peacekeepers, which we expect to lead to concrete policy results by the time that the ministerial meeting takes place in Accra. And Pakistan alongside Japan also held in, 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 from the 30th to 31st of August, uh, the important meeting on the safety and security of peacekeepers. The last preparatory meeting, which took place in Kigali, Rwanda, um, uh, last uh, month, uh, was on the protection of civilians and strategic communication. This was co-hosted by Indonesia, the United Kingdom, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And I think it was fitting that uh, Rwanda hosted such a meeting because of the history that um, uh, hate speech itself has um, um, fomented in the destabilization of their country and the experiences they had learned. The discussions that have ensued in all the preaching meetings have, among others, confirmed that there's a need to address um, strategically and uh, urgently the challenges that we see in the arena of peacekeeping. And there's also a strong acknowledgement, as, as far as we can tell, that peacekeeping continues to be an important instruments available for the United Nations to continue to stabilize countries and to help them transition from conflict um, into peace. Numerous lessons have been learned from the preparatory meetings and I'm sure that uh, uh, our colleagues would speak to them in more detail and so I'm not going to do that. Um, but we feel that following the very useful discussions that have taken place, the challenges that have been discussed, the lessons learned that have been shared. Um, there is a very good foundation that has been laid for us to be able to go into the ministerial in Accra with some set of um, issues that we can all build upon. Um, in terms of the updates for the meeting in Accra, um, I want to indicate that virtually all arrangements have been made at this stage and um, there is a, a website that we would want to um, draw attention for all to, to look at, which is um, Accra. Accra is spelled A-C-C-R-A, 2023, pkm.mfa.gov.gh. And it, it has all relevant information, including historical peacekeeping ministerial meetings that have been held but also uh, relevant information such as background papers on the teams, the logistical and administrative notes that has already also been circulated to members of the C34 uh, since uh, 11th of October, and also the provisional program that um, would run um, as through the meetings in Accra, in which Jean-Pierre shared, including the three sessions, but also um, two side events that will take place on the 5th of uh, December uh, prior to the main event on the uh, 6th of December. The deadline has been extended and so we encourage all uh, delegations to um, quickly um, uh, ensure that they register to enable us have details of those who are participating and we encourage participation at the very highest level. Um, we also would use that registration process to uh, uh, facilitate um, local uh, curtsies because then we know exactly when uh, delegations are arriving and um, the type of facilities to put at their disposal in terms of local curtsies. Um, the most important thing 
is the pledges. And uh, we cannot say that enough. And so I, I, I very strongly um, uh, reiterate the call that Jean-Pierre uh, Lacroix, the USG for the Department of Peace Operations has made that at the end of the day, we want the pledges in terms of uh, um, the commitments that uh, member states are willing to demonstrate in support of peacekeeping. And um, that is something that I would also want to encourage all delegations um, to critically look at and to come to Accra uh, with a sense of uh, 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 a strong expectation that pledges have to be made. And the Department of Peace Operation stands ready to support delegations that need assistance to be able to craft their pledges um, in support of peacekeeping. Um, let me conclude by saying that uh, we very much look forward to many delegations at the very highest levels uh, at the ministerial in Accra um, to enable all of us to um, make a strong commitment to peacekeeping and also, as has been indicated, to see how we take forward the uh, new expectations for peacekeeping, taking into account the challenges, the um, geopolitical uh, divisions that exist, and also the strong uh, push for partnerships, in, especially on the African continent, in ways that will make peacekeeping a continuing and relevant uh, instrument for the United Nations and international community to support countries that are in fragile and conflict contexts to be able to transition into peace. I thank you very much, Jenna. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for those comments and for reminding us that peacekeeping was born out of necessity and has continuously been strengthened through adaptation. And I think the need to continue on that is perhaps as urgent as ever. So we thank you for those comments and thank you so much for your leadership on the ministerial. Next, we'll turn to our panel. We're very pleased today to welcome representatives from member state co-chairs and also the UN Secretariat who have partnered in hosting the various preparatory conferences over the past few months. So first we have, uh, I'm a bit out of order in our seating, I hope you don't mind. We have Shoaib Abdullah from the permanent mission of Bangladesh to the UN. Dr. Adarsh Tawathia, Principal Medical Officer and Deputy Director of Division for DMOSH. For those of you that don't know all of those acronyms, it's the Division of Healthcare Management and Occupational Safety and Health within the Department of Operational Support. Next, we're quite pleased to welcome Ambassador Jadun from the Permanent Mission of Pakistan to the UN. And finally, we welcome Ed Kalin, Military Advisor from the Permanent Mission of the Netherlands to the UN. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, Shoaib, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. The Permanent Mission of Bangladesh co-hosted the preparatory conference on women in peacekeeping along with Canada and Uruguay, which was held in Dhaka this past June to discuss progress, challenges, and good practice on increasing women's meaningful participation in peacekeeping and to support the implementation of the uniform gender parity strategy. We'd love it if you could tell us a bit about the outcomes of your preparatory conference uh, and any of the key takeaways you'd like to share with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Moderator, for giving me the floor. And uh, at the outset, I actually thank the delegation of Ghana and IPI for organizing this very important policy forum. And I also thank the Under Secretary General, Mr. John Pierre Lacroix, for his kind presence and also very good opening remarks. And also Ambassador of Ghana for giving us the overview of the peacekeeping ministerial. So uh, I think before the peacekeeping ministerial, we will have a very uh, having this event will actually uh, help us to uh, uh, get an overview of the four preparatory conferences and it, it will be very helpful for the member states like uh, actually the preparatory conferences were designed in a way to shape the um, uh, shape the way to the peacekeeping ministerial uh, and to uh, help the member states to know the needs specific needs and challenges uh, of the peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations and uh, to subsequently to make pledges as uh, Under Secretary General has also mentioned to make an overall improvement which are critical for mandate delivery. And uh, I think like we'll be, we all will be helpful today. We all will be like uh, 
get benefits from this policy forum today. So as you have as you have already mentioned, like the first preparatory conference was held in Dhaka on 25th and 26th June. And actually Bangladesh, Uruguay, Canada and Uruguay were pleased to co-host the event. Uh, and I actually thank Canada and Uruguay like for the great support for co-hosting their event in Bangladesh. And uh, in that two-day event, actually, one close to 150 participants actually uh, joined from 35 UN member states and also all the UN personnel, <laughs> think tanks, academia, and peacekeepers met to discuss and address the opportunities, challenges, and barriers to the meaningful participation of women in peacekeeping. Uh, we were pleased to have the kind presence of our Under Secretary General for DPO and also our Under Secretary General for Management, Strategy, Policy, and Compliance, Ms. Catherine Pollard, in the preparatory conference. Um, the conference actually provided an open forum for member states and the UN to deepen their understanding and share best practices on challenges and barriers to women's meaningful participation in peacekeeping. Uh, it also talked about like measuring opportunities for women in peace operations, barrier assessment methodology, uh, gender responsive leadership, and inclusive teams. Um, safe, respectful, and enabling environments, uh, accountability for conduct and discipline, and achieving the implementing of a UGPS, the Uniform Gender Parity Strategy, and also the role and contribution of the LC Initiative Fund. So it is an overview like uh, the session, uh, the conference was divided into seven different sessions and uh, covered a wide range of issues. So in that in the conference like participants and panelists are emphasized on many issues actually so i, I tried to uh, summarize something like like they, they emphasized on how the partnership among the stakeholders can be strengthened it was uh, heavy, like mostly discussed like many many participants actually mentioned this uh, this issue of partnership and also they emphasized on the leadership commitment uh, it's very important. And also um, we talked about uh, enhancing accountability and also the data-driven approaches. Um, and also uh, they talked about deploying and nominating women to all roles in peacekeeping operations. And they emphasized on this and deploying gender responsive capabilities and also uh, addressing the gender bias and discrimination along with other issues. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like the conference was very helpful for understanding the pleasing process for the ministerial. There was a dedicated session for uh, on pleasing process, and it was really helpful. And while discussing on the pleasing process, like uh, people actually emphasized on the issue of considering gender integration and equality as an inherent practice of peacekeeping efforts. So, and the participants also discussed the existing gaps in implementation of gender responsive facilities and infrastructure on the ground. Um, some participants actually went to detail like what are the needs in terms of uh, gender responsive facilities and infrastructure. We had very good points in the, uh, in the conference and also uh, people actually highlighted the importance of barrier assessment by the member states. So it was really important topic, like we had a very good session uh, on the barrier assessment and how to encourage the countries to have that assessment. And uh, sometimes the, the countries are uh, somehow skeptical about sharing the uh, results and other things and go, to go into the barrier assessment. So how to encourage the countries, particularly from the secretariat to have that barrier assessment and to share. And also like the career development opportunities at the national level, and it was also discussed. So, in a nutshell, I would say, uh, on the question of developing and maintaining momentum around the issue of women in peacekeeping, uh, in, in the conference, it was highlighted that the importance of having good coordination among member states and the UN Secretariat, it was highlighted, and the incorporation of gender aspects in the man mandates and also in other relevant documents of the United Nations. And uh, that's how people actually shared that we can keep the momentum. And, and if we shed light on what specifically we need, then the list will be very long. People shared a long list of issues that what we need at this moment. But I would say again, like the assessment of barriers to women's participation to help the organizational structure. People emphasized on this and the issue of enhancing training on gender responsive leadership and prevention and response to the sexual harassment and also they discussed this, addressing the stereotypes and biases in the society and, and so ensuring enabling environment infrastructure and also services in the peacekeeping operations mm -hmm. so it was also clear from the discussions that the commitment from the highest political level is critical so 
uh, and that for me and I everyone actually agreed that the ministerial would be the best platform to receive concrete and specific commitments, particularly from the highest political level. So uh, we, the co-host like Bangladesh, Uruguay, and Canada are grateful to Ghana for prioritizing the topic of women in peacekeeping. And I believe we are now better prepared to meet in Accra and commit to pledges that will positively impact women in peacekeeping beyond their increasing uh, deployment numbers alone. And, we are also pleased that women in peacekeeping will be highlighted in a side event in the peacekeeping ministerial. It will be co-organized by Sweden and the UN Department of Peace Operations and in coordination with the WPS Chief of Defense Network. So, uh, and it will be on the role of gender responsive leaders. We have heard from USG also about this. And uh, I think uh, it was our pleasure, like it is our pleasure like presenting this report here. And I like, uh, we saw in the conference like how concrete and tangible examples of how we can invest in gender responsive leaders and create workplaces that pro proactively fight discrimination, harassment, and abuse, and strengthening the systems of accountability. And I think in the conference, like the participation of USG, uh, Ms. Catherine Pollard added a value on like a particular focus on accountability. And uh, I think it, it was really important while we are discussing about women in peacekeeping. And people also share best practices. And uh, I, in the conference at the, on, on the last day, the actually the participants also visited the training center, BIPSOT in Bangladesh to get an overview how actually Bangladesh is working for partnership and to collaborating with other Peacekeeping, peacekeeping sending countries, peacekeeper sending countries. So it's not possible. Like uh, I had a, like a nine pages long summary of the uh, conference, but I will be happy to answer any question. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shoab, for that. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Tawatia. You've been helping to lead the Secretariat's work on supporting the mental health of UN peacekeepers, something that was also discussed in Seoul in 2021. Um, can you tell us a bit about the current progress in this area of work and areas where member states can continue to provide support for implementation? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, uh, inviting me. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Operational Support and USG, Mr. Kare, uh, I'm pleased to be here and I want to thank um, Ghana for putting mental health for uniform personnel on the agenda for the ministerial. Thank you for that, sir. As uh, well as I want to thank IPI for all the support that you have given us in making this uh, topic. Um, which is very, very real uh, in the outside world, as we know, post COVID, but also uh, needed addressing for our uniform personnel. I, uh, so the pre-ministerial on mental health was held on Zoom. Uh, I was unable to travel, so we just, and uh, we did it on Zoom. And I think um, because it was virtual, it attracted a large uh, audience. We had uh, nearly about 180 people for the one and a half, two, uh, no, it was, I think, about three hour session and we didn't lose one participant. And uh, I put that uh, to the credit of the audience that they uh, laid such emphasis on this topic that they wanted to hear all of us speak to it. Um, so uh, mainly in the ministerial, I um, outlined exactly what uh, my division and my team were doing. And I'll give you an update on that. Um, uh, I think uh, the UN is finally at a place where we are acknowledging the fact uh, that our uniform personnel uh, are also human beings. Uh, they are not machines trained uh, as soldiers and police uh, to uh, and do suffer from mental health issues. And as you said, the first time we uh, brought this topic up was in the Seoul Ministerial, where we were looking for XP uh, support uh, to be able to address this uh, very, very important topic. And I'm very grateful to Germany and to Israel who stepped forward at that time to uh, give us the funding to be able to start on the work in 2022 um, on developing the mental health strategy uh, and the mental health strategic framework uh, for uniform personnel in the field. That strategy uh, is ready. Uh, I'm happy to announce uh, uh, in 
it has been uh, now it's in a place where it is ready to go for editing, final editing and translation. So hopefully by the end of the year, um, we will have the document ready. Um, during the ministerial, uh, there was a lot of conversation regarding capacity building, bilateral capacity building by member states and how they could uh, assist member states who don't have the capacity for pre-deployment trainings or uh, screening capacities. Uh, some of the member states who don't even have a mental health policy for the uniform personnel at present and how this particular framework could uh, be something as a stepping stone for them to start looking at how to develop their own uh, national policies. So I think that was very encouraging for us at the UN to see that we could probably be uh, the leaders in helping member states, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of step forward uh, and uh, do what is needed for our uniform personnel, not only the ones who get deployed in peacekeeping, but also those who serve in their own national militaries. Uh, and police um, uh, uh, in, in their own countries. Um, I think um, I would be it would be remiss if I do not also touch on the fact that um, we um, to, write, writing a document and making a writing a strategic framework and then putting that framework on a piece of paper and on a website does not help our uniform personnel. They don't know what's happening. They don't go to that website. They never look at that uh, document. So it was very important for us to consider how we could reach that individual personnel. And uh, the, um, I think what we decided to do was uh, develop an app, a mental health app, which is specific to the UN. Uh, and it's, uh, and, uh, the feedback we got from the uniform personnel on the issues they wanted addressed uh, regarding their mental health. And uh, this app, uh, again, needed uh, some support from member states, uh, which I am hoping we will fi finalize during the ministerial. But that app is something which will give the power to the uniform personnel in the palm of their hands. And uh, that is what would be the success of this mental health strategy. I do not think we can succeed by just writing a policy and putting something on paper. So uh, I'm hoping that we will have that, start work on that last next year. And uh, hopefully by uh, September, we would have launched that. It's ambitious. I'm told I'm very ambitious. Uh, but uh, ambition is what has got us here in improving the medical support that we have been providing to our uniform personnel, which has changed. Uh, since 2015 and the struggles that they are facing in the peacekeeping arena. I'll stop here and take questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tawatia, for sharing that. And I'm sure um, it would be great to come back to some of that during the Q&A time. Next, I'm very happy to turn to Ambassador Jadun. Ambassador, Pakistan co-hosted the preparatory conference on safety and security of UN peacekeepers in partnership with Japan. And certainly the issue of safety and security has been a pressing concern particularly given the difficult contexts to which peacekeepers are deployed, as we have been discussing. Can you speak to some of the discussions at the preparatory conference you hosted when it comes to increasing safety and security? Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Jenna. <clears throat> Under Secretary General Lacroix, Excellencies, distinguished participants, uh, very happy to be here. I would like to provide you a brief overview of the thorough and extensive deliberations that were held during the two-day preparatory conference on safety and security of peacekeepers. This was held in Islamabad at the Center of International Peace and Stability. It's our premier peacekeeping training institute. Uh, the conference was held on 30th and 31st August with the presence of over 40 member states, around 150 delegates, including from member states and also from the UN Secretariat. We were very pleased to have Under Secretary General Lacroix himself there, as well as uh, the Under Secretary General for uh, DOS, uh, Mr. Atul Khare. We had a very rich and substantive uh, discussion, very good exchange of views. So we broke down the topic into five sub themes. Uh, first, uh, so the overall theme was safety and security, but the five sub themes were uh, capacity building needs, uh, international law perspective, medical capacity role of technology and strategic communications and the threats posed by improvised explosive devices, IEDs. 
we also organized one session on uh, system of pledging where uh, the UN Secretariat people and also one of my colleagues uh, gave an overview of uh, how pledging is done, what's expected. And in uh, our case, we also outlined how Pakistan uh, formulates and finalizes its mm -hmm. pledges. We thought that session was very useful for member states to understand the expectation from them at the Ghana ministerial, like Mr. Egeman said, probably one of the most key or most important issues there. Uh, so during the meeting itself, the there was the common refrain was that today peacekeepers face uh, different kinds of challenges. Mm -hmm. The environment is complex. The threat levels have uh, changed, and uh, it, a lot has been done to uh, reduce fatalities and to reduce uh, preventable accidents, etc. So in some ways, the safety and security aspect has been addressed. But then because of the changing nature of the environment in which they operate, uh, these uh, safety and security threats have heightened on, uh, on, on other counts. So there is a need to identify the gaps and to uh, get empirical data and to fill those gaps, to address those particular elements. Uh, there were uh, five key takeaways that uh, we could distill from the entire conversation and I would uh, briefly uh, elaborate on them. The first one was on mission workplace safety. So it was identified and to my personal surprise that most of the uh, accidents or fatalities do not happen from hostile actors in the field, but actually from preventable accidents and uh, safety hazards. Mm -hmm. uh, which are not essentially security threats, but safety uh, concerns. And these are often due to a lack of qualified experts who can support workplace safety and mitigate preventable fatalities or serious harm. And also due to a lack of accurate data on the causes of safety hazards and where improvements are needed. Uh, this uh, I think emerged as the key area which needs further attention. The second one was on medical care. Uh, some of it has been addressed by Dr. Tivatia. Uh, indeed, uh, the lack of adequate medical care also uh, leads to, uh, in, this is not only uh, physical medical care, but also mental health, which uh, affects the performance of peacekeepers and their uh, safety, uh, safety aspects. So therefore, adequate medical care should be improved through better training, more gender responsive health care, better mental health care, speedy casualty evacuation and the optimum use of telemedicine. Third area was on improvised explosive devices. In terms of uh, the threats from hostile actors, uh, this is uh, today easily the uh, biggest uh, cause of casualties in peacekeeping missions. And often the peacekeepers lack uh, requisite training and equipment to counter these threats. But uh, the meeting after discussions identified that it can be considerably mitigated and countered because the uh, uh, training uh, capability, through training, cap uh, training, better training, but because the capabilities exist within uh, militaries, mm -hmm. the uh, equipment exists, some of it was displayed also from our side and the standard operating procedures also exist, uh, but uh, perhaps to better integrate them or to better train the peacekeepers in them. Fourth area was leveraging technology and training, uh, ensuring that peacekeepers have the information and the analysis needed to improve situational awareness is also critical to their safety and security. Uh, this can of course be done through better training and capacity building for effective and timely intelligence peacekeeping intelligence, as well as bolstering of strategic communications and enhancing efforts to address misinformation and disinformation, uh, which is on the rise worldwide. Uh, there were several, there are several new and emerging technologies that can enhance safety and security, as well as the success of UN peacekeepers, and there is a need to better leverage them. And the fifth and last uh, theme that we identified as a key takeaway was uh, this need to improve accountability uh, because of the lack of accountability for crimes committed against peacekeepers, uh, mm, uh, there is often this sense of impunity and frustration also amongst the group contributors. This is partially due to lack of capacity of the host country's national institutions, which are often broken down 
in those environments uh, also a shortage of specialized personnel and the difficulty in attributing responsibility for ied attacks but uh, there is great room for ensuring uh, for improving uh, this accountability aspect so in each of these areas we hope that the ministerial meeting in ghana will formulate some clear recommendations for policy and for action covering resources capabilities and responsibilities i already touched the pledging system uh, where we had a session uh, participants were briefed on how to formulate uh, good quality concrete pledges which are which should be in the form of a commitment from the highest political level with a tangible and concrete outcome that can be tracked and that will be implementable in the near term a uh, few words about uh, ipi uh, you were uh, very helpful in partnering with us providing us substantive inputs uh, for the concept note and for the whole uh, framing uh, of the meeting it's very much appreciated also ipi partnered with us in august 2021 during the last uh, ministerial cycle we hosted along with the netherlands a virtual format preparatory meeting and at that occasion also you uh, partnered with us that was very much appreciated um, even this type of gathering where you bring in all stakeholders member states academia think tanks civil society very useful and adds uh, very substantive inputs to the whole conversation and we also like to uh, appreciate and thank the department of uh, peace operations led by his excellency and the secretary general lacroix for their partnership with us was very significant uh, in terms of uh, the setting of the program etc but also getting the right resource people mm -hmm. uh, from the un headquarters also from the field and they brought very very valuable perspectives uh, which fed into the meeting and very much appreciated uh, so uh, in conclusion the meeting uh, we think greatly enhanced understanding of the challenges associated with the safety and security of peacekeepers and also in identifying the measures that will be required to address them we think it will contribute significantly to the success of the ministerial meeting in accra and go a long way in improving overall the efficiency and the effectiveness of un peace missions it's uh, in our view peace safety and security uh, on which pivots the entire success of the un mission thank you so much excellent thank you so much ambassador we appreciate that and i think uh, it's good to know that even though these were separate preparatory conferences how much interlinkage there is between the topics when we're talking about safety and security with mental health and women peacekeepers and technology that these are really interrelated issues Finally, I'm very happy to turn to Ed Kalin from the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands co-hosted the preparatory conference on the protection of civilians and strategic communications, uh, along with Rwanda, Indonesia, and the United Kingdom. Um, as you start your comments, maybe if you can also say a word about the decision to pair these two specific topics together um, in terms of combining strategic communications and the protection of civilians, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm pleased to be here and uh, let me start with thanking uh, Ghana for organizing the peacekeeping ministerial and thanking IPI for organizing this event. Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, nothing lasts forever and change is the only continued. Having said this, I'm happy that almost every event organized in the context of peacekeeping commences with a speaker who touches upon the evolving environment with the aim to enhance awareness, situational awareness. This is an important first step and eventually every organization, so the UN as well, has to figure out the ways its goals, its modus operandi, and its means align with this evolving environment in order to be successful. Noblesse oblige. The UN has to be successful as millions of people in this world depend on the success of the UN and the UN peacekeeping. Regarding the involvement environment, organizations have to change. People within the organization have to change. The organizational culture has to change. And here, our role comes into play. Without commitment of strategic leadership, 
as well as the member states and the academic support of think tanks, a cultural change will not occur. And consequently, the UN will not be in line with the evolving environment and probably will be unsuccessful. Having said this, I would like to thank you for your commitments and the awareness of the necessary change for the future and future success. The Netherlands is a country that stands for alignment with the evolving environment and therefore embraces change as a condition for success. The Netherlands has championed the Action for Peace, Action for Peace Plus, from the earliest stage and will do so in the future in at least two areas. Firstly, financial support to think tanks as they are our academic conscience providing us with proper ideas for the organizational change. Secondly, support to the preparatory conferences and the peacekeeping ministerials and other events within the UN. As these events provide the Netherlands with the opportunity to share their thought of its thoughts on change and several other topics. So in Ghana, our Minister of Defense will attend the peacekeeping ministerial and will surely touch upon the consequences of an evolving world, the necessity of situational awareness and understanding, as well as performance, and of course, the safety and security of peacekeepers. Furthermore, our minister will definitely touch upon the importance of protection of civilians and strategic communication. And referring to the remark of the chair, uh, Jenna, uh, it's interlinked. The protection of civilians and uh, STRATCOM are interlinked uh, because you can uh, reinforce protection of civilians with a, a proper uh, strategic communication plan. And if that is not uh, that well uh, thought through, then it will have a negative effect on protection of civilians. So our minister will touch upon that topic as well. And as already mentioned, we, all, we do that not in isolation, but we uh, did uh, the organization of the PrepCon with, together with uh, Indonesia, Rwanda, and the United Kingdom. And last but not least, um, Women, Peace and Security, and of Women, Peace and Security, and the, the positive effects on the evolving environment and the necessary change will pass the review as well. Um, Yes, and finally, um, as mentioned before, um, I would like to thank the leadership of it for its commitment and the recognition for the necessary organizational change. Your commitment, our commitment, is a precondition for success of the UN peacekeeping on which millions of people depend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed, for that. We have a, a bit of time now for Q&A or other types of interventions. We're happy to take questions and comments from the floor here in the room, and we're also able to take questions and comments from our online uh, participants. So if you want to enter something into the Q&A feature, uh, we'd be happy to read that out. Uh, we have some mics going around, so anyone who would like to take the floor, please go ahead and raise your hand. Yes, down here in the front. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself before you make your intervention, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this event today. Um, and my question is gonna be direct to the Abdullah on the Women, Peace and Security uh, event. And as also, I'm gonna start by using the ambassador of Netherlands that nothing lasts forever, but I wish that Women, Peace and Security lasts forever because we need to increase the number of female or women in general on the ground. Uh, I'm telling that my name is Ivana. I'm a Brazilian officer. And right now I'm temporarily deployed at the office of the special, special coordinator of the UN response on sexual exploitation and abuse. 
And my question goes direct to this topic, because unfortunately, the numbers of allegations have been increased, and unfortunately, we have just uh, repatriated 13 peacekeepers due to lack of accountability, lack of commander control, and also due to sexual exploitation, exploitation and abuse. And my question goes direct is how can we, as, a, as, a, as an organization, address this topic in a way that, because it touches performance, it touches <coughs> accountability, it touches security and safety. And we want to, to deliver the legacy of the United Nations has to cover more things than that. And it, of course, it interferes in the mental health. So it's just um, a way for us as researcher, as this International Peace Institute, as ambassadors, all of us together to think on what kind of measures we're going to use in order to mitigate this high risk of this terrible issue on the ground. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Let's take a few and then we'll go back to the panelists down here in the front. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm Ron Nebrunstein. I'm the Deputy Military Advisor of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for all the panelists for their uh, elaborative uh, speeches. And I'd like to address uh, the, 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 the presentation uh, and the back brief on safety and security. Uh, I think it was very informative to hear that uh, a lot of casualties emissions are basically, uh, could basically be avoided because they are the result of occupational health and safety issues. Uh, and, and I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that, on, uh, on, on, on the prevention of that and also uh, the, the the division of, of labor there in, in the sense that uh, I don't think we can only point to the secretariat to to take care of, of every problem that, that that there is present in, in UN peacekeeping. I think it's a combination of of, of, of through contributing countries uh, and the secretariats and and the partnerships between uh, between us. So I was wondering if you if if has that been discussed and if you could 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 say a little more towards that point. And basically the same goes for the medical care. Uh, knowing that the UN has made large strides in the improvement of, of medical care, and, and I, I only have to look at, uh, at Dr. Ardarsh, uh, who has been a driving force behind that. Uh, I think you pointed out uh, right to see that there are still some, some per very pervasive issues there when it comes to CASAVAC. Uh, but we also know that there are still troops in missions deployed uh, that basically don't meet the requirements. They are not able to fulfill basic first aid. They are not capable of calling in uh, a CAS effect because they don't know how to, how to call in a four-liner or a nine-liner. So also there, I was wondering, has there been discussed uh, how, the how the responsibilities there should be divided in addressing these issues? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Rhonda. We'll take one more. Yeah, I think maybe right next to you. There we go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Bridget. I'm also from the Netherlands Mission Military Department, so Rhonda's colleague. Um, thank you very much um, for being here and for your, all your contributions. I also have a women, peace and security related question. Um, I was wondering, so yeah, more in general, I'm very curious what the key takeaways were. If you could uh, identify a few, it would be very helpful. Thanks. But also more specifically, I was wondering if you um, also reflected on the fact that, of course, women, peace and security is something we'd like to address in its own right and is important to see on its on its own. Um, but it's also very much a cross cutting a cutting theme, um, which is, of course, also something that should be integrated in different areas. Um, also different areas we discussed today, like safety and security and other uh, things. Um, so yeah, if you could reflect a bit on how to sort of maintain the importance of addressing it in its own right, but also um, uh, have not forgetting um, that it's something that we can't just see separately from all the other topics that are relevant for peacekeeping. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start with those and then we'll do another round of questions. Shoab, would you like to go first? A couple targeted towards you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for a very uh, important question and an interesting question. So 
Uh, first, I'll respond to the question on the accountability. As I mentioned, like uh, we had a dedicated session in the conference on uh, accountability. And if you see the uh, title of that session, actually effective partnership for strengthening accountability for conduct and discipline in peacekeeping. So yes, uh, in the last few years, actually we become successful at least to increase the number of women. Maybe we have some gaps in the military contingent and other areas, but still, the progress is encouraging. But at the same time, uh, yes, it is very important to, uh, to address the accountability issue. And uh, I believe uh, in that seminar and also in other forums, we discussed mainly two issues. The first thing is like, it should be enhanced in the pre deployment training. We need to change the mindset. We need to work with the mindset of the peacekeepers. And the other things are cooperation from the host government also. Like, in that case, many issues are related, like standing, standing their judicial sector, standing their security sector also. Like uh, when you are holding account, uh, holding the perpetrators accountable, so you need to enhance, uh, stand in your judicial sector also, like to get the proper evidence and other things. So these things were discussed, but uh, people actually, as I said, like uh, focused on training and changing the mindset. And I, I believe like these are cross-cutting issues. Like we talked about misinformation and disinformation and uh, negative propaganda, propaganda against the peacekeepers. So like uh, we always talk about one issue, like winning the heart and mind of the people. So if you want to do this, if the peacekeepers want to do this, they actually, uh, we have to address seriously the accountability issue. And otherwise, these, these uh, traits of the, this conduct of the peacekeepers, misconduct of the peacekeepers will actually can be used as also uh, to negatively propagate their work and other things. Mm -hmm. so, so I think pre-deployment training and partnership is really important to the host countries and the UN Secretariat and on the, also the TPCCs. And should I go to the second question? What was that? Okay, the cross-cutting issues and other things. Yes, like I didn't mention, like uh, I, I, in my summary, there was like, we had a very good discussion on mental health also in the women in peacekeeping. We had a very discuss good discussion on digital technology. Like as, uh, as like in the F4P, like in the F4P plus priorities, there are two cross-cutting issues, digital technologies and women in peacekeeping. So what we need, like when we discussed women in peacekeeping, even when in the C34 negotiations, like, there were some arguments like whether we should discuss it in other chapter or not. We have a dedicated chapter on women in peacekeeping. But I would say like what was uh, what was the outcome of the our preparatory conference also. I mentioned one line like the, uh, we have to consider gender integration and equality as an inherent practice of peacekeeping efforts. So this is the theme actually. You can't actually separate women in peacekeeping as a separate issue. It's a cross-cutting issue. That's why it is in the F4P plus priorities is a cross-cutting issue. You need to discuss every aspect in the women in peacekeeping. Whatever you are talking about safety and security, you are talking about digital technology, you are talking about mental health, every time women in peacekeeping will come. So uh, I think uh, the only solution is we need to have an overarching view and, and this is the only solution. You can't actually separate it as an, an, an only one issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Ajidun, maybe we can turn to you next. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, the meeting helped identify the primary cause for uh, the threats to safety and security of peacekeepers, and it emerged that they're, all these preventable, uh, they uh, primarily arise from preventable accidents and illnesses. The uh, In the context of occupational uh, safety, the uh, mission workplace safety, but also inadequate medical uh, capabilities. And this is a shared responsibility. It's a shared responsibility between the troop contributors and the UN Secretariat, of course. Uh, no one side is fully responsible for it. On the troop contributor side, they, of course, have to improve um, training. They have to improve awareness raising. And like you mentioned, uh, at least uh, the troops should be able to administer first aid and be able to follow the UN guidelines, this 10 plus 1 plus 2 rule or 2 plus 1 rule. And uh, all the, so when the standards are set, the resources and capabilities should match those. And uh, 
all, during the meeting of telemedicine, for instance, was uh, emerged as a very promising area, which because these areas are remote and do not have very good capabilities. And even with the field hospitals, perhaps not the same level of some particular specializations of uh, support. So telemedicine could be employed. Uh, in the militaries, there is this system of uh, feedback and uh, briefings and debriefings. So they are constantly evolving themselves, I'm told. And in our uh, context, in our case at least, uh, so whenever there are, uh, these type of lessons are also learned at a national level on based on experiences from different missions and then integrated into the syllabi and the uh, training curriculums so that they are more equipped for the next deployment. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tawapia, can we turn to you? Uh, yes, um, let me address uh, gender uh, and mental health. So we've incorporated a whole um, annex on gender and mental health in our strategy. We worked with all the gender focal points uh, in the secretariat uh, on uh, to develop that because we heard stories. So two of my team members who are psychiatrists traveled to missions and they met with uniform personnel. And the feedback we got from women is that though in the pre-deployment training, a little bit of mental health is spoken to, but what we are not prepared for is what we are uh, told to do when we reach a mission, and that is go to villages and speak to women. And these women who have been have been gang raped, their children have been killed in front of their eyes, uh, and they have observed uh, brutality at a inhumane uh, level, and they don't know how to respond to them. And because they have not been trained for such a thing. And, uh, and then they come back and suffer from mental health issues. And there is very little support uh, for mental health in missions at present. So that's what we are trying to change. That's the change we are trying to bring around mental health in peacekeeping missions. And hopefully by next year, this would be, we would be in a better place. Uh, I would like to address two or three things about uh, illnesses and occupational health being the leading cause of, um, uh, let's say, uh, death, or I won't say so much as death as uh, leading to um, EVAX and uh, case EVAX, medivax, or repatriations. We need the support of member states. Since the day I joined the UN some 20 plus years back, uh, this has been a hot topic, and that is medical clearance of uniform personnel, which is a national responsibility. I have personally repatriated people with cancer of the liver on the very first day that they came to a mission, first day of duty. That person couldn't have been medically cleared. We've had during the HIV AIDS epidemic, we had people with AIDS being deployed. I'm not saying AIDS, HIV positive, but actually fulminant AIDS being deployed to missions. So we have seen, or I've seen over the last 20 plus years, a lot of that. And I think members, we need to work with member states on this issue to ensure they send healthy people. During COVID-19, uh, because there were lockdowns and uh, there were uh, troops who, who couldn't go home, we discovered a lot of those troops had illnesses with which they should not have been deployed. And therefore, they were at greater risk for COVID-19. Right, so uh, we in the UN have worked since, as uh, Rhonda said, since the HIPAA report came out, uh, been working on improving the medical support uh, in peacekeeping missions. It's been a slow journey, I agree, but things change slowly at the UN as we all know, because we have to engage 124 or 126 troop and police contributing countries and change comes slowly. Behavioral change in medical personnel comes even slower. I'm sorry to say this, but it is true. Uh, uh, we uh, are taught medicine or are trained in a particular way. And when we are asked to change our behavior, just because the UN is telling you to change behavior, it, just, it takes time. And But I must say we are in a much better place today uh, than we were before. Telemedicine is one other project which is really, really going to change how we uh, provide medical support. The major, um, I think the major case to be made for telemedicine is at the point of injury. 
it is a huge challenge for us. Uh, we are negotiating that challenge, working on it, because when uh, people are working on TOBs or they are in a convoy, they are in areas where there are no connections, there is no internet connection, they cannot reach. Telemedicine is of no help unless you have a communication device with you. And we are working on giving them BGAN satellites and other satellites so they can connect with their level ones when something happens to a convoy or in a TOB and in so that they can communicate with their own doctors in a language that they understand you know that's language being a huge issue for us also we can't expect um, a convoy uh, say from bangladesh uh, uh, trying to talk to the chinese hospital which is deployed as the level 2 in their area so that is uh, an, so this training that we have to give to individuals on how to use telemedicine as you can imagine, is also a huge challenge because troops rotate every year. So the training has to be ongoing and it has to be. But I love a good challenge. So we have been working on that and hopefully uh, things will improve in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Agumen or Ed, if you wanted to come in, otherwise we also have a couple of other questions we can take. Okay, any others from the floor? Okay, we'll take one here and then I have two from our online participants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gay Rosenblum Kumar from Nonviolent Peace Force, which had the great privilege of participating in the Kigali Prep Con, thanks to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which supported having civil society representation. And my colleagues were able to meet with the participants and share the perspective of local communities in how peacekeeping is seen from the ground up, uh, which I see as part of the needed change mentioned by USG Lacroix and Mr. Kalin. So I would like to ask the panelists their thoughts on how civil society can be invested in and more involved as partners in the changes that are needed. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. I'm going to read two of our online questions. The first comes to the from the Deputy Minister of Defense for Administration, Liberia, and a former UN DSS officer. The question is, can the UN commit to doing more in terms of support to troop contributing countries in the area of mental health for our troops, especially post-deployment? Um, and Dr. Tawati, I know from hearing some of your, your previous presentations, there is a focus on the whole life cycle of deployment pre, during, and post. So I think it would be interesting to touch a bit on the post-deployment phase. Uh, and the second question uh, comes from anonymous attendee. Some countries are not able to participate in the ministerial for different matters. Is there any possibility to have participation of at least presenting a writing about the country's participation in peace operations and the importance of the conference and giving support to it or following remotely? So perhaps Ambassador Agumen, you can speak to that one. Uh, Dr. Tawati, I'll turn to you first. Thank you very much for that question. I think that is a really, really important question. Uh, so we in our strategy and our annexes have given resources for pre-deployment, during deployment and post-deployment support of uniform personnel. How we can, uh, the UN is happy to partner, but mainly I think in the ministerial, we've asked for bilateral capacity uh, building and capacity development between countries and the UN of course will get involved uh, if needed. Uh, to help uh, countries who do not have the capacity to follow up on men their uniform personnel on mental health issues. And uh, we are, again, the app that we are building uh, will also, or hope to build, uh, once the funding comes through, uh, will be something which will address this as well, again. So, uh, yes, that is... A, that's something we are hoping will be pledged during the ministerial, the bilateral capacity buildings. Um, I just want to say about civil society engagement, uh, just from the mental health perspective, I think uh, the LC initiative is working towards uh, that uh, for women and in peacekeeping as well as mental health side. Uh, and I think you're doing, they're doing a great job. I haven't engaged much with them because my focus is more on the uniform personnel. And, uh, but I have uh, heard them, spoken to them, and I think that is an important step 
and we could probably in the future work together on that. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the essence of the peacekeeping minister in Accra is supposed to uh, get in high level participation in person. And so that is the focus that we have um, for the Accra Peacekeeping uh, Ministerial. But um, in terms of um, um, getting the meeting out, um, so far we're looking at um, ensuring that it's streamed uh, live for the opening and the closing. And um, we would consider perhaps the possibility of whether uh, we can also look at some of the sessions, if um, that would be helpful for those who are unable to participate. Um, uh, uh, in person, but the, the essence is to get high level participation in person, not only um, for them to be able to make the pledges and the commitments, but also for them to interact with one another in a way that um, all of us can drive the processes a bit, a bit further than it is at the moment. Thanks so much for that. I want to give the other panelists a chance to respond to Gay's question as well. Um, you know, certainly the, the ministerial is a bit more narrow in scope in terms of targeting member state pledges specifically, but on the topics we're discussing today, I think that the point about host communities is really important. Um, Ed, I don't, I don't know if you would want to weigh in, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but I think perhaps the topics of POC and strategic communications are both quite appropriate for thinking about relationships with civil society and host community. So if you want to you want to jump in on that. Well, let me let me make a general remark about the uh, role of the uh, think tanks in, in general. Um, I think uh, these organizations are outside of the UN organization and have a probably broader view are not limited by boundaries. So I think the way they think um, yeah, has really added value towards, uh, towards the UN and the missions. So I think that is my um, more general remark about this. And if the evolving world demonstrates us that um, the world is getting more and more complex, think tanks have probably specific knowledge about specific problems in a specific region. And that knowledge is the key to future success. Instead of, and I take myself as an example, I have a probably a broader overview of problems, but every region has its specific problems. And that's the reason uh, why I think uh, think tanks can have uh, added value. Thanks for that. Um, one more question online. Um, this is coming, uh, it says, armed group and IED attacks are a great concern for safety and security, as we were discussing earlier. Timely investigation and bringing perpetrators into justice could act as a deterrent and reduce the attacks against our peacekeepers. On that note, is there any, are there any statistics on how many such inst incidents are being investigated and if the offenders are being brought to justice? Um, as a, a bit of a flag, just to say that IPI actually published a report specifically on this topic last year on accountability for crimes uh, committed against UN peacekeepers, um, and that was part of our work on A4P Plus in partnership with the Netherlands. So I would refer you to that. I know there are some statistics within that report on the number of incidents that have occurred, the types of processes that are taking place um, to try to hold them accountable. Uh, An ambassador, as you already mentioned, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, legal accountability for crimes committed against peacekeepers, in particular because it is the host state that's responsible for holding those perpetrators accountable. Um, and oftentimes those contexts uh, experience very uh, weak or nascent or underfunded institutions. I wonder if you have uh, any additional comments about how member states can continue supporting accountability. Thank you. Uh, I do not have particular statistics, uh, but I'm sure the report that you mentioned, uh, I will look that up and would be, be more useful to, because I think you would have aggregated the mm -hmm. data from across the globe and uh, 
like I mentioned, the need for accountability is very, very important, very significant for ensuring safety, security of peacekeepers. And uh, in my remarks, I mentioned about uh, uh, the problem of attributing IED attacks. And it's not just about IEDs, it's about any uh, attack. In uh, March of last year, uh, USC Lakwa would recall a Pakistani helicopter was shot down in Democratic Republic of Congo mm -hmm. uh, with eight people on board, six Pakistani peacekeepers and two from other nationalities. And uh, I, it, it, even attributing that was very difficult. Uh, was it the M23? Was it the armed forces? And then they were blaming each other. Both were saying we have evidence against each other. And then uh, it's so it, the challenge is first to attribute or identify the person responsible. And once the identification is done, Pakistan cannot do anything about it, or perhaps not even the UN. It's up to the host mm -hmm. governments, the host countries to act, which is yet another challenge. Oftentimes, the criminal justice system there is uh, disintegrated because of the security situation. These are real challenges, but uh, perhaps something to think about how this accountability uh, can be brought in. In uh, I know it's going to be very controversial, but uh, perhaps something at the UN level uh, mm. to ensure that if there is a crime committed against the peacekeeper, uh, then uh, it goes beyond national jurisdiction, something mm. of that type. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe also uh, within OROLC, the Office of Rule of Law and Security Institutions, there is uh, a working group that is working specifically on accountability. And I think to your point, it's a really good reminder that because it's so difficult um, to establish accountability for these crimes, prevention is really a primary focus when it comes to IED attacks and other types of attacks against peacekeepers, um, that, that much of the focus should be on prevention, um, even as we seek to, to find other avenues for accountability. We're just about out of time. Uh, Ambassador, I don't know if you have any anything you'd like to say before we wrap up today, but we really appreciate your being here. No, oh, just to thank um, everyone, especially the uh, who's for the preparatory conferences for sharing with us this rich uh, um, uh, recollection of all the elements that we've discussed in the lead up to Accra, and particularly for the questions that we have posed, which are very pertinent uh, and, and uh, very helpful for all of us to be able to further improve the way and manner in which we interact with peacekeeping. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today to DPO, USG Lacroix, and to the permanent mission of Ghana, and of course to you, Ambassador, for your leadership and the opportunity for us at IPI to partner with you and support. We also thank the Kingdom of the Netherlands for their generosity in supporting the organization of today's event. Um, just to close, it's no secret that our world is at a very difficult moment right now, and it's really imperative for us to continue to come together um, and find ways to work towards peace and serve those on the ground who need it most. So thank all of you for your continued efforts in this area, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much, everyone.